The rapture is going to be a mind-blowing event. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Lee Brainerd. Welcome to Soothkeep. This is another edition of Prophecy in the Crucible, where I address issues pertinent to the church in the last days. We cover the prophecies, the apostasies, and spiritual warfare. Now, the aim of this channel is to encourage, educate, and arm believers. We are living in the most exciting time to be a believer since Jesus Christ walked on planet Earth and died on the cross. But it is also a dangerous and deceptive time. Are you prepared? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18, we read about a dramatic event known as the rapture, which is the church's blessed hope. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall be with the Lord forever. Therefore... Comfort one another with these words. Now we know from other passages in the Bible that the rapture will occur prior to the tribulation at the end of the age. Revelation 3.10 says, I will keep you from the hour of trial which is coming upon the whole world. That hour is the coming tribulation. John 14.2-3 says, In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. When Jesus left, he went to the Father's house in heaven. And so we know that this promise is not Christ coming to us after the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, Christ and his church are reigning here on earth. This can only be us going to Christ before the tribulation to go to the Father's house. Folks, our destiny is not going through the tribulation. Our destiny is going to the heavenly city. And we know from many events which are happening around us in this world, events which are setting the stage for the tribulation, that the rapture is rapidly approaching. We don't have a lot of time. The stage, in fact, is set so far that the rapture can happen, can literally happen, any day now. Now, the rapture is going to shock the world. Across the entire globe, at the exact same moment, every born-again believer on the planet will vanish. And this vanishing act is going to blow the minds of everyone on the planet. It will affect three distinct classes of men, believers, unbelievers who knew the truth, and hardened unbelievers. If you are a believer, your mind is going to be blown by four amazing things. You will experience amazing change. You're going to have a changed body. You're going to lose this temporary tent and get a permanent home. We read about this in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. And this resurrection change will be like moving from a worn-out pup tent to a beautiful mansion. You're also going to have a change in location. You're going to be suddenly seized and rapidly hauled up to the clouds. And there you're going to be joining millions of happy saints who are chest bumping and fist bumping and high-fiving and hugging and weeping for joy. Another one of these little changes is going to be the weight will be gone. The weight of sin will be gone. The weight of your sin nature. The weight of struggles with sin. The weight of bad memories with sin. And the weight of worldly cares will be gone. The weight of bills and taxes and health issues and lawyers and the cost of living and making ends meet. You're going to have no more sorrows, no more pain, and no more disappointment. It's going to feel like taking off a heavy pack after a long, hard hike in the mountains. 
The second thing is that you are going to find yourself standing in the presence of that amazing man who spoke the universe into existence and died on the cross, who died for you. And you will be overwhelmed when you see him. And your circuits are going to be completely overloaded when you realize that he is just as excited to see his church as they are him. This is like the groom embracing his bride or a man welcoming his friends, a man welcoming his brethren. Think about the, all the happy emotions of a wedding and all the happy emotions of a family reunion jumbled together without the taint of sin. Now the third thing that's going to happen is your jaw is going to drop when you see New Jerusalem. This is an amazing display of architecture that is far beyond the ability of mortal man. The skyline is many hundreds of times higher than the tallest buildings that man has ever built or capable of building. And the beauty will be unparalleled. The city is going to be a cosmopolitan delight without any of the ugly or the dirty or the sin which mar our cities. The city will also have features which are absolutely astounding, which manifest the insane glory of God. For one thing, the city will be lit 24-7 by the glory of God. The streets are of clear gold. The gates are one solid pearl each, and the foundation stones are massive blocks of precious gemstones. And then the city is filled with people. We'll be able to see the apostles and the prophets and the Old Testament patriarchs and all the great preachers and revivalists that we've read about and have long wanted to meet. The fourth thing is that your breath is going to be taken away when you step into your mansion. The mansion which the master carpenter custom designed for your taste buds. He custom designed it just for you. And you're going to step into your mansion, you're going to look around, and you're going to think, this is so me. And you are going to feel home for the first time since your Christian sensitivities were sharpened by the word of God. Now, unbelievers who knew the truth will have a very different mind-blowing experience. First of all, missing the rapture is going to bring stunned unbelief. Folks are going to be walking around in shock. Their parents are gone. Their children are gone. Their brothers and sisters are gone. Their cousins and aunts and uncles are gone. Their friends are gone. Church members are gone. Some of the churches, most of the church members are gone. Some of them, many will be gone. Some of them, only a few will be gone. And the guy who preached to you at work is gone. The radio preacher you listen to once in a while is gone. People are missing everywhere. But then, missing the rapture will lead to awful agony. These folks are going to know that the door is shut, that they were amongst the foolish virgins and not amongst the wise virgins. They know they missed a golden opportunity and they'll be moaning and groaning and pulling their hair out and throwing stuff and kicking stuff. And this will lead to weeping and sobbing. I should have believed. I knew better. I should have taken it to heart. I kept thinking I would get serious someday. And someday never came. And these folks are going to know what the future holds. And they are looking at the future with horror. They know they're going to go through the tribulation. They know they're going to face the Antichrist. They know they're going to face wars and the judgments that are mentioned in Revelation, which decimate the world's population. The fact is, at least one third of the world's population will be removed in the first half of the tribulation alone. We're talking something around two and a half billion souls. And they know they are going to face the mark of the beast if they make it through the first half of the tribulation. And they know that choosing salvation instead of the mark means losing their head. Folks, be warned. If you're not saved, don't put off your salvation any longer. Get saved today. Those who miss the rapture are going to get a miserable second chance. This is like dilly-dallying at the bridge crossing, thinking that you can cross the bridge at any time, and then watching with horror as the bridge collapses. And now you have to swim the croc-infested river, filled with hungry crocodiles, to get to the other side. 
Now, if you have a shaky profession of faith and you're living in sin and compromise, it's time to get serious. As Paul writes in 2 Peter 1.10, make your calling and election sure. In other words, make certain, absolute certain, that you're saved. Folks, not everyone who professes to be saved is saved. Go read Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Now, there we read, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. And they're going to tell him everything they did in his name. And folks, these weren't pew warmers. They were very active. And the Lord is going to reply, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. You don't want to play games with salvation. Get right today. Now, the unbelievers who have been hardened by the lies of the serpent are also going to have their minds blown, but in a different way altogether. Imagine the shock when tens of millions of people from all around the globe vanish in the same moment. There's no logical or rational explanation. No traces left of them except for their clothes and their jewelry and their false teeth and their medical implants. And there, everything is left right where they were standing or sitting or laying. Many disappeared in front of witnesses, some of them in front of dozens or hundreds of witnesses. Police station phones are going to be ringing off the hooks with missing persons reports. Parents are going to call worried about their kids. Kids are going to call worried about their parents. Teachers will call worried about students that vanished from their high school or grade school or college classes. Coaches are going to call about players who disappeared during football practice. Places of employment are going to call about employees that vanished from the work site. Doctors and dentists are going to disappear at work. Pilots and stewards are going to vanish into thin air in the middle of flight. People are going to be shocked. And they're going to have nightmares for days on end. Folks, the rapture is going to shake the world like 9-11 shook America. It's going to be headline news. It's going to be the big talking point of all the talking heads in the media. There will be non-stop talk about it for weeks. Experts in diverse fields from astrophysics to religion are going to offer their thoughts. TED Talks will bring on some of the brightest minds in the world. Bill Gates will offer his two cents worth. So will Elon Musk. And so will the Pope. And numerous theories are going to be offered. But everyone will outright reject the idea that the Almighty God of Christian mythology actually came down from heaven and removed his followers. The problem is... They're going to be forced to dance around the fact that only Bible-believing Christians disappeared. Now, the world experts and the world leadership are going to scramble trying to arrive at some kind of consensus on the event. A few theories are going to gain credence, like the New Age teaching that the universe is going to recalibrate itself and return to balance, which boils down to karma for those evil Christians. But the theory that's most likely to prevail is the alien abduction theory. They're going to claim that the Christians allied themselves with an enemy from elsewhere in our galaxy. And from that point on, the Pentagon and all of its compatriots around the world are going to begin drawing up a response. They are going to begin preparing for the coming invasion, which the Christians call Armageddon. They are going to begin preparing to fight God. Folks, you can't stop this event from blowing your mind. But you can choose in which of these three ways that it will blow your mind. Will it be blown by excitement and joy and relief when you're celebrating in New Jerusalem? Will it be blown by agony for missing the rapture, knowing you're going into the tribulation? Or will it be blown by the reaction of hardened unbelief? And it's going to dawn on you, wow, there really are aliens, and they're coming to invade us. Folks, it's all up to you. The ball is in your court. How are you going to respond to the fact of the rapture?